Okay, it's all you, Howie. All right. Good evening, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, like Dave said, um, my, my power also has been going in and out intermittently. So my Wi Fi has been going out and my internet's been going out. But hopefully, hopefully, so far, hopefully this will work out. Maybe the storm isn't supposed to last that long. It's been, I guess that's really been one of the themes of this year weather wise. So welcome to the, welcome to the third and our fourth, uh, fourth four lecture series. Uh, this evening, we're gonna deal with something more, more contemporary. In the last two sessions, we dealt with events that happened a century or longer ago, the Dreyfus Affair, the Balfour Declaration. In our last two sessions, we're gonna deal with more recent things. So today we're gonna talk about Bernie Madoff and that scandal and how that was reported in the Jewish press. And then in our, last, in our last session next week, we're gonna talk about how the Jewish press handled and covered and responded to the Abraham Accords. Um, so first, since, since we're talking about more recent events, let me start with um, a disclaimer. Uh, there is a rule of thumb among historians, where as a rule, as a general rule, you don't talk about things that are too recent or how recent is too recent for a historian. And the general rule is if it happened during your own lifetime, it's too recent to talk about with any real historical perspective. And obviously Bernie Madoff, that was just a few years ago. So normally, uh, this is not a topic I would speak about historically. I, uh, and, and I say this as a caveat because we're still, we're still wrapping our minds. We, we understand what happened. We have our views of what happened. But in terms of the larger historical forces, dynamics, background to the Bernie Madoff scandal, we're still figuring that out. I mean, like, as we'll see tonight, you know, we're still working through how something like that would happen, why someone would do that. I mean, that the epitome, the, the epitome of it, as we shall see, was this is a, this is a Jew who stole money from Elie Wiesel. How, how are we to wrap our minds around such a thing? Thankfully, uh, in our series, we're not only talking because in, in the context of our series, we're not only talking about the event itself. We, we're, you, we're, we're, we're really trying to understand how the Jewish press, how Jewish journalists and Jewish writers handle an event like that, and that we can, we, we, can get a, we, we can get a decent look at that. But I think also, for an event this recent, the most, uh, an effective way to get some kind of perspective on it, even though we don't have any real direct historical perspective, is by comparison. So I wanted to start this week by uh, reiterating something that we, and elaborating on something that we mentioned in the first week. Now, and don't worry if you weren't here, I'll catch you up right now. But if you, if you were here the first week, you recall that when we spoke about Dreyfus, we noted that the Dreyfus affair was the third in a trilogy of turn of the 20th century French politics. So the Dreyfus affair was preceded by a conservative coup led by General Boulanger in 1888. And then it was, and, and then it was also preceded in 1992 by what came to be known as the Panama scandal or the Panama crisis. And that's what I wanna to return to this week because the Panama crisis in a way has certain parallels to the Bernie Madoff scandal. So before we dive into Madoff, I thought it would be useful to look at Do you have a Yeah, I Somebody not muted that, oh, uh, sorry. I, I thought it would be useful to look back on that scandal and see, see the parallels between that and Bernie Madoff, what we can learn from the Panama scandal and how that'll give us some framework, some perspective, some context, some comparative, comparative context for Bernie Madoff. So what was, so what was, so here we go back to 1892. And the, the, the short version of the story, as I mentioned, is that in one of the first attempts to dig the Panama Canal, France was the country that sort of took charge of it. And several several wealthy French entrepreneurs, they raised an enormous amount of capital, millions and millions of French francs, which they were going to use to fund an, uh, a private operation acting on behalf of the state, of the French state, to dig the Panama Canal. Now, if you know your history, the Panama Canal was not dug in, 19, in, in 1892, nor was this event called the Panama Canal Crisis. It's only called the Panama Crisis because they didn't succeed in digging the Panama Canal. The whole thing was a disastrous failure, partly because of the bugs and malaria, uh, partly because the whole thing was just so disorganized, both from the vantage point of government, both from the vantage point of this of, of the organization of the, of the corporation that was supposed to dig it, but 
what, what wound up happening is several of the entrepreneurs who gathered, the, who, who uh, collected the capital, the investment to dig the canal, they absconded with the money. Now, among these entrepreneurs, there were a number of prominent French Jews. And I put two on your handout, if you have the handout. One is Jacques de Reinach, and the other was Cornelius Hertz. Now, before I tell you what their role was, and what they, specifically the one thing you have to understand about them, they weren't just French Jews. I mean, these were emancipated French Jewish citizens, but they were both from immigrant German Jewish families. So they both were relative newcomers to France, keeping in mind that in the 1890s, there was a deep mistrust between France and Germany, which means if you were French, you distrusted everything about Germany, German politics, German culture, anyone who came from Germany, including G German Jews and German Jewish immigrants. Plus, Reinach and Hertz living in France, they were, they, since moving to France, they had grown up there, they were acting very acculturated, very, the word we use is gallicized, very, you know, Frenchified. And so the notion was uh, that they were doing that so they could infiltrate French society. So by definition, if you were foreign, you were suspected. And if you were German, you were even more suspected. So here you have these two German Jewish immigrants who are now French citizens in the 1890s. They, they take part in this entrepreneurial enterprise to dig the Panama Canal. When it absconds, they're the ones who steal all the money. So they're going to become sort of the target of the criticism. And as we noted when we spoke about Dreyfus, the what came out of what came out of the Panama Crisis in France was this sense that uh, Jewish citizens, French Jewish citizens, a are innately foreign, foreign. They're not really French. They're outsiders. But b, perhaps even more important in this context, they are anti-French. They're just they're not only not French, they are the enemies of France. And they're not a direct military enemy with, a, with an overt, you know, a, a open invasion. They're a more insidious, uh, covert in, invasion of France. So in this case, the, the, uh, the, the upending of the, Panama, of the Panama project was a way to upend or undermine French pres prestige at home and especially globally. And remember, this is the age where, this is the great age of European imperialism where European countries and especially the great powers, England, France, Germany, Russia, Austria, Hungary, they are competing to see not only who's going to be the strongest country in Europe, but who's going to be the strongest colonial empire in the world. And the Panama Canal was going to be, was supposed to be a vehicle for France to extend its influence, they were, they were going to be the ones who, who controlled this crucial waterway connecting the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. It was going to be this great, let's call it a great overseas, a great colonial victory for France, uh, a source of great prestige. And it was undermined by these two outsider, un-French, anti-French Jewish immigrants from Germany. So as we asked with Dreyfus, one of the questions we asked with these two, how significant was it that they were Jewish? Was it more about them being foreign and from Germany or, or did the fact that it was Jewish have something to do with it? And Jewish journalists at the time, they addressed this very question, not only in France itself, but elsewhere in Europe as well. There was concern uh, primarily among Jews in France, but among other Jewish communities as well, that this event was going to affirm what anti-Semites said about Jews and especially what racial anti-Semites said about Jews. And remember in the 1890s, racial anti-Semitism was still relatively new. It was barely 20 years old. It was a novel form of anti-Semitism and it hadn't yet, it was only in the process of becoming mainstream. It didn't have that wide an audience really really didn't have much of an audience until World War I. But in the 1890s, it had some followers, most, you know, uh, polite society in most countries, mainstream society, intellectuals, they tended to see it as something uh, radical, as something, you know, very kind of quirky. They didn't think it was going to take. But uh, an event like this gave these, gave racial anti-Semitism more teeth. So, Let's look, at, let's look at a couple of examples about how contemporary Jewish writers respond. And so 
Here, let me share my screen here. Let's just do this. Oops, do this first. Let me share my screen. Uh, let's put this. Wait, I think I have to, hold on. Just a minute. Where is it? I think I have to. Just a second. Oh, can everyone see this? With this. All right. Can everyone see this? Okay, good. So let's look. Let's look at uh, look. Let's look at text excerpt number one. This comes from uh, a uh, the Hungarian Jewish uh, weekly we've been quoting in the last couple of sessions. As you can see, it's 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 one of it's one of my favorites. It's a, it's a, it's a really good newspaper. Really really quality. I mean, as you know, as newspapers go. Um, but this was an article that was written in, in the December of 1892, which was just after the, the, the Panama scandal was coming to light. It was becoming not only news in France, but also elsewhere. And this, is, this was a, a report. This was the, 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 the Paris correspondent of this newspaper writing home about this scandal in France. And he writes, this is text number one, quote, report from Paris, according to public opinion, the rising anti-Semitism was set in motion by the legal and parliamentary discussions of the Panama scandal to hand, hammer big capitalism. Reinach's legacy, remember he's what he was sort of the, 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 the mastermind of all of this, of the scandal. Reinach's legacy will surely will endure in political life, in the press, in the realm of scholarship, in parliament and the military and among accomplished statesmen and honored nobles. So here's a writer who says, this is not just a passing thing. This is going to be something very significant. Now he didn't realize how, pre how prophetic he was being. This is two years before Dreyfus. And as we noted, when we talked about Dreyfus, this is going to be one of the contributing factors why Dreyfus became such a big scandal. But already by 1892, there is a sense that there is a rising anti-Semitism in France, even before the scandal, there's, there's is the beginnings of it, but this scandal really accelerated, accelerated it. Now, the following year, there was another, an, another, another comment. This is a year after the scandal is done. This is after some court trials have been taking place. And this is a report, uh, really an excerpt from the debate in the French parliament about the scandal. So, so this is text number two. This is a year later. The French parliament is still talking about the scandal. It's still talking about who was involved. And this, this is a, a, a French member of parliament named Rouenet. And this is what he says. This is text number two. Let us, remember he's speaking to the members of parliament, which means he's also speaking to the press. This, these statements, certainly the significant ones were, were published and made public to people. He says, let us talk about Panama, a scandal, attributed, should say attributed to Jews, okay? So in a sense, he's reiterating this, this, this concern that people are going to say the, the, the Panama scandal is a Jewish scandal. Okay, but listen, watch where he goes. True, Reinach and Hertz were Jewish criminals, but and this is the interesting part, 100 million francs appeared in the pockets of pious Catholics. The members of the board of directors, in other words, the board of directors of the corporation that did this, were Catholics and aristocrats, with one or two Jews among them. Catholics were just as greedy as Jews in all this swindling. So first, of all, he, here he's sort of responding to the notion that the Panama scandal was a Jewish scandal. This is a member of the French Parliament who says, "No, this is the problem. Here is not." specifically Jews, the problem is the corruption of capitalism. The problem here is general greed. And he's saying that, yes, these two Jews stole a lot of money. They embezzled a lot of money, but they weren't the only ones. The bigger problem is, the bigger problem he's raising is, why is there all this corruption involved with this important project that would, that would, that would help France? And he, and he concludes by saying, anti-Semitism is the latest weapon in the battle between movable and immovable capital, which I'll explain in a second. All right, well, let me explain. Movable and immovable capital, you know, movable capital means cash, means liquid assets. Immovable capital 
typically means land. So when you talk about the battle between movable and immovable capital, you're talking about the battle between the commercial elite, most of whose value is in, is in cash and movable assets, and the landed aristocracy. Whose, whose assets tend to be immovable. Now, what does it mean? Anti-Semitism is the latest battle weapon in the battle between immovable and movable capital. He says anti-Semitism is not as grassroots as you might think. It's really just a con it's a conflict between, between powerful aristocrats in France representing the old guard and a, a, a nouveau riche commercial aristocracy or commercial elite that's challenging their authority, that's challenging their dominance. So th this, is a, this is a member of Carbon who's saying, you can't fully understand this scandal simply as something that Jews did. It's part of an, a larger economic struggle between uh, what today we would call uh, the 1% and the middle class. So I'll just, uh, and, and I'll, yes, in case you were wondering, this member of parliament, Rouenet, is a social democrat. This is a left wing, this is a left wing member of the French parliament. I would say, now that I think of it, this is basically Bernie Sanders in the French parliament. But, for his, but from his point of view, the problem is not Jews. The problem is this, this is a capitalist problem. And then he ends by saying, and this is a typically French thing to say, anti-Semitism is entering our country from Germany. Now, this is a defense of France. Basically, it's saying, yes, there were these two Jews who were involved in this capitalist, you know, this capitalist swindling, capitalist corruption, but they're not French Jews. Anti-Semitism is not something inherently French. It's imported from Germany. The problem isn't here. The problem is there. Now, now first, it's saying that we have to be careful about immigrants, but it's also saying that Reinach and Hertz should not reflect badly on France because they're not really French and anti-Semitism, you know, by extension is not really French. It's actually, it's going to be something imported. Now, all of this is going to sort of lay the groundwork for, for drivers that we spoke about last time. But, but now what I'd like to do is I want to use this as a, as a point of comparison to talk about Bernie Madoff, because in some sense, we have some similarities. In some sense, we have some differences. And I think I think the largest question for us to consider as we look to look at a couple of Jewish responses to Madoff is what did the Bernie Madoff scandal mean? How did it impact anti-Semitism in America? Clearly it didn't create it. Obviously anti-Semitism and even rising anti-Semitism had preceded Madoff, but it's, it's a question worth pondering because, in, because uh, well, and, and we, we can do that in, in, uh, in comparison with the Panama scandal. Okay, so first let's make sure just in the unlikely event that someone isn't clear what, what, uh, what Madoff did, let me take. Madoff was basically, you know, to, I don't know if it's mixing a me mixing metaphor say that Madoff is the, quint is the quintessential Ponzi scheme. You know, Ponzi was an Italian who perpetrated this kind of, well, I was about to say that Ponzi per perpetrated a Madoff scandal. So they're, they're very similar. Madoff, he, uh, for, for a long time, he, he uh, was funding a, a bunch of organizations, a bunch of private ventures, uh, uh, an investment, and he was uh, convincing the people he was working with and helping to invest in certain, you now make these investments, which turned out to be fraudulent and wound up stealing in the excess of $50 billion, okay? But the weird thing about the Madoff scandal, and here's, and, and here's maybe our first difference between Madoff and the Panama scandal, is that, is that Madoff, Madoff targeted a lot of people, but most of the people that Madoff targeted, certainly a, a significant amount of money that he stole, he didn't steal from ordinary American investors, he stole from other Jews. The Madoff, now he didn't steal exclusively from Jews, but he stole a lot of money from other Jews. So right from the bat, we can draw the contrast that the Madoff scandal was a more internal Jewish affair or internal Jewish communal affair, whereas the Panama scandal really was much more external. It involved a much broader population. So what does that mean does that, uh, in, in terms of how that scandal is going to have an effect? How is it going to affect 
the non-Jews looking in at it and how is, it, how is it going to affect the Jewish response to it? So let's read one of the initial responses. This one is, this is, this is uh, here, let me share the screen again. Uh, this is text number three. And this is, this is an article written in 2008 in Haaretz. Um, one of the first, you know, one of the first sort of you know, reflective essays written about Madoff. Now, just, just one little note, it's written by Bradley Burston. Bradley Burston is probably in Haaretz, he's probably one, he's one of the furthest to the left writers that they have. So keep keeping that in mind, I would, I would expect to see, given his politics, some compare, some similarities or parallels with this left-wing French member of the French parliament. Well, let's see what we see. So this is text number three. Okay. This, and this is an article he wrote called The Madoff Betrayal, Life Imitates Anti-Semitism. Okay. He writes, for the true anti-Semite, Christmas came early this year. The anti-Semite's new Santa is Bernard Madoff. Okay. The answer to every Jew hater's wish list, the Aryan nation at its most delusional couldn't have come up with anything to rival this. The former chairman of NASDAQ turns out also to be treasurer of the board of trustees at Yeshiva University and chairman of the university's business school. Rich beyond human comprehension, he handles fortunes for others buying and selling in a trading empire that skirts investment banks and other possible sources of regulation. He redefines avarice, knowingly and personally bilking charities and retirees in the most classic of con games. Even better, for those obsessed with the idea that Jews control finance, entertainment, and the media is the idea that Madoff's greed was uncontrollable enough that he targeted fellow Jews, even Holocaust survivors, some of them his own friends, as well as Israeli companies who insured Jews, including Holocaust survivors. The beauty part for the anti-Semite, Madoff's machinations, which could have been put to use for the sake of humanity, have directly harmed Jewish welfare and charity institutions. So there's a lot there. What, what, is, what, what are the things that Burston's saying? First thing he's, he's saying unequivocally that regardless of whether this was an internal Jewish affair or not, the, the, the fact of Bernie Madoff and what Bernie Madoff did would feed anti-Semitism. And in the mind of anti-Semites, it's going to valid, it would validate certain assumptions and stereotypes that anti-Semites make about Jews. And let's be clear what those are. First of all, the notion that the Jew is the quintessential capitalist. And, and, and the stereotype of the Jew being the quintessential capitalist isn't only an economic statement that you know, Jews are in business, Jews are out for profit. It's also a value judgment because for critics of, anti, for critics of, uh, of capitalism, capitalism is the epitome of greed. You know, if you, ever, if you, if you remember the movie Wall Street with, uh, with Michael Douglas, Gordon Gecko. He gives that whole speech about greed is good. That is the quintessence of capitalism for the critics of capitalism, including, by the way, Oliver Stone, who's the critic, who's a critic of corruption in the capitalist world. I mean, not he doesn't want to get rid of capitalism. He just doesn't like that. It can be very corrupt. Okay. So the first thing he's going to say is it doesn't matter on, on, on a basic level, the very fact that Madoff turned out to be wealthy, connected you know, running NASDAQ, but also connected to Jewish organizations and then turned out to be a con artist, that is reinforcing the stereotype that Jews are quintessentially greedy capitalists. All they want is money and they are without any kind of moral center. They, they are without ethics, okay? He redefines avarice, all right? Um, then there's the idea of, Jew, of the secret Jewish cabal of Jews controlling finance, Jews controlling media. And here, Burston points out one of the ways that Madoff did it was by, he, he was able to, to, uh, to circumvent government regulation by dealing exclusively with 
private corporations that were beyond or at the at the uh, beyond extensive government government regulation. Now remember, he's writing Burson is writing this in 2008, and remember one of the big debates in 2008 was the need for greater government regulation of Wall Street, greater government regulation of private enterprise and private business, and for for critics of capitalism in general, Madoff exemplified the need for this great this greater regulation. The notion being that if there was some kind of if there were more if there was some kind of regulation, Madoff wouldn't have been able to pull this off seemingly so easily. Okay. But then there's the part about Madoff targeting fellow Jews. And here, you know, here you can almost see Burston pausing as a writer, pausing and sighing, because it's one thing if he, if he was just acting in a way which, which, which was uh, de, de, you know, detrimental or harmful to other people in general. That's, that's the, that, then it would just be the old notion of look, making look Jews bad in the eyes of their Gentile friends and neighbors and the eyes of the state. But Madoff targeted other Jews, and you can hear Burston sighing, and you can hear him. You can almost hear the question mark. See the question mark over his head. He's perplexed. He's perplexed that he targeted fellow Jews, even Holocaust survivors, some of them his friends. At this point in 2008, there's this notion trying to figure out what it is Madoff did. The sense of being perplexed is how, how can not just how can anyone do this. Why would anyone do this to their friends? Why would someone, why would a Jew do this to Holocaust survivors? And remember, this is Madoff who had been involved in Jewish, Jewish, commun Jewish communal affairs and events. This is someone who, who seemed to have some kind of Jewish conscience, but clearly in this instance, it began to fade. So Madoff, it, it, this, is, this, is an, it, this is an initial reaction. It's a raw reaction. I mean, burst off person's reaction to this, at this point, he is trying to make heads or tails out of something which was very, very perplexing. So Burston, does, Burston is, is doing less about uh, looking long-term. He's basically, in the short term, he's gonna say, anti-Semites are gonna go, aha, I knew it, all Jews are Bernie Madoff. But, but also, uh, he, he's putting on the table the need to understand how someone like Bernie Madoff is, could do this to other Jews, all right? Now, as time went on and we had more time to think about it, uh, other writers came up with other suggestions, all right? And, and, so, and some of these are more compelling and some of these are maybe less compelling. So let's look at text number four. Okay, where is that? Okay, let's see. Oh, yeah, share the screen, just a second here. Uh, there we go. All right, let's look at text number four. This is an article from the Jerusalem Post in December in, uh, in December 2008, right around the time of Burstons. But this writer is going in a slightly different direction. And okay, what does he say? All right. Now remember, the goal here is to try to understand what's going on in Madoff's, what's going on in Madoff's head, but also what does this mean? Uh, what's the impact of this event? What can we learn more broadly from this event? Okay. Family is key in the Madoff saga. So here's a writer who's gonna to try to understand this in personal terms. And he's gonna to try to deconstruct Bernie Madoff a little bit, maybe something, maybe something familial, all right? While there, this is text number four. While there is no allegation at this point that family members did anything wrong, remember it's just, it's just December, 2008, they have become central figures in the Madoff saga and his quiet, up from the bootstraps journey from humble beginnings to, to financial powerhouse to global fraud. So here I would pause and say, part, you know, part of the perplexing part, part of the story is that before the scandal, Madoff was a great example of a Jew, this rags to riches Jewish story of a Jew self-made man who really sort of rose to the ranks. And you know, he's a, he, he, came, he came from humble means and was able to do this and it turned out so bad. Okay. There are the two sons who turned him in and are reported to be cooperating with prosecutors. Madoff's wife, who once compiled a kosher cookbook, has come under scrutiny during the investigation, and Madoff's brother Peter was a driving force in transforming Madoff's firm into a renowned investment house 
and remains a top official in the, co in, in the company. In other words, what the author's saying so far is, yes, Madoff did this terrible thing, but let's not read, let's not re read too far from Madoff to the rest of his family. These are nice people. These are decent people. Maybe Madoff is the exception, the outlier. He's an anomaly. Let's not condemn the entire Madoff family because, and that's what he means. His wife compiled a kosher cookbook. What a nice lady. Uh, you know, that's, that's not a con artist. That's, that's just a, you know, a kosher cookbook. It doesn't, it doesn't get more Hamish than that. Okay. And, and, and here's a quote. Quote, they were two struggling kids. This is Madoff and his brother. They were two struggling kids from Queens. They worked hard, said Thomas Morling, who worked closely with Madoff and his brother Peter in the mid-1980s, setting up and running computers that made their firm a leader in off-floor in off trading. Quote, they studied hard. They got good grades and put the firm together with a lot of hard work and sweat, unquote, was how Morling heard it. And unlike others in that world, he said, quote, when Peter or Bernie said something that they were going to do, their word was their bond. Everybody trusted what they said, unquote. In other words, here is an eyewitness account that said, whatever Bernie Madoff did in this scandal, he wasn't always like this. He, he, he came from humble beginnings. They worked hard. They earned what they had. They were this success story. Okay, let me go on a little more. Those values of family and trust were among the most enduring elements in Madoff's life, but each image was shattered by his stunning fall. In other words, what makes the story even, what makes his scandal even worse is this was a person who cultivated close relationships with family members, close business relationships with family members, with friends, with colleagues, and he cultivated a sense of trust, but then he used this trust to try to steal from everybody, okay? He, in, in a sense, this family, you know, family values of closeness, you know, we have familiarity, all we need is a handshake, that kind of thing. Uh, we, we naturally trust each other. He completely undermined it and betrayed it. Coworkers and friends are left questioning what they really knew of the man whose life's work may end up being a complete lie, okay? One more quote, one more quote the article brings, quote, I will say this to you. They were nice people, nice people, said Sidel Meyer, a member of the Palm Beach Country Club, where the Madoffs were members and had a vacation home. Quote, I knew them for 30 years. I never, ever would have believed it. So Madoff is the story of the, he, he, this wasn't an obvious story. This isn't someone you sort of watch and, you know, he, he's basically a huckster his whole life and, and rises in the ranks. And no one is surprised when it's revealed how corrupt he is. This is the opposite story. This is, a, this is someone that everybody liked. This is someone that everybody trusted. This is someone everyone assumed was, uh, you know, a decent guy. I, I have to be honest, you know, and I, I remember during the, uh, you know, a personal recollection, during the Madoff story uh, in, in 2008, what it reminded me, because when I was a kid, uh, there, there was, a, it wasn't anything on the same kind of scale, but the whole Ivan Bosky scandal went down. And, you know, Ivan Bosky had his Detroit connections. I, 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 you know, there was a kid, there, there was a kid who was one grade behind me in school who was related to him. He was also a Bosky. And it was just very, the whole thing was very, very surprising because, you know, there are also pictures of Ivan Bosky giving all this money to JTS. It's perplexing in that way. So Madoff, May, no, I'm not comparing Bosky and Madoff, by the way. I'm just sort of, it's another example. Don't walk away and say, you know, all he did was sling money, sling money at Bosky. That's not what I was doing. Uh, but, but, but Madoff, part of, part of the perplexing part of the story is this, this was someone that every, no, no one would have thought was going to turn out this way. There was a kind of shock value to the whole story. Okay. But, it, but you can see in, the, in these initial responses to Madoff, uh, there's not much more than simply coming to terms of uh, the fact that he did it and how surprising that is. It would, take a, it would take a full year. It would take, a, it, it would take longer for writers to, well, to writers to begin to really try to understand it, okay? So a year later in Commentary Magazine, Jonathan Tobin, who is, he is one of the best Jewish journalists we've got. He writes excellent columns, all right? He, he was one of the first to begin to reflect not only about what Madoff did, 
but what are the larger implications for the whole Madoff scandal and, and, and lar the larger implications for the, well, the future of American jury. And his article was called The Madoff Scandal and the Future of American Juries. So let's take a look. Now, this is from Commentary. By the way, you, you know, Commentary is completely digitized now. You can, you can read anything from Commentary you want. You know, when you go back far enough, you have some, there, there's great stuff in Commentary from the 40s and 50s. Okay, so this is text number five. Quote, the long-term threat for Jewish philanthropy then isn't Bernie Madoff, but rather the overall threat facing the larger Jewish community in the United States, what came to be known nearly two decades ago as the continuity crisis. Now by continuity crisis, COVID means who are going to be the next generation of Jewish leaders, where's gonna be the next generation of philanthropists and givers, and uh, you know, is, is there going to be a, you know, it's part of, is there going to be a real Jewish future in America? Now, before I say anything more, I'll just, just sort of parenthetically add here that uh, the concern over the continuity crisis is not, it did not begin, you know, at the time of Bernie Madoff. The, the, the conti what, what, what Tobin calls the continuity crisis began with the beginning of American Jews. Every generation of Jews in America, without exception, at some point, has worried that it was going to be the last generation of American Jews. There is no generation of Jews in this country that didn't think it was that didn't think it might be the last. So the you know the continuity crisis and how is Jews and Judaism going to how, how is Judaism and the Jewish community going to survive in America? That's a long-standing thing. But here Tobin is saying this is really the latest the latest installment of the continuity crisis. You know, at the turn of the 21st century, there are all these alarming signs, and Madoff is Madoff's. Uh, misuse of philanthropic endeavors, Madoff's taking all the taking this money away from philanthropic organizations is simply adding adding fuel to the fire of this concern for continuity. Okay, should Jewish organizations attempt uh, attempt greater outreach to increasingly secular members of the community, even or especially to those who have intermarried? to help maintain bonds of kinship and prevent their becoming just another ingredient in the multi-ethnic American soup? Or should efforts focus on reinforcing the core Jewish population and give it succor and succor and strength and to keep its people and children within the fold? So this is, a, this is part of this larger continuity debate. How should the resources of the Jewish community be deployed to firm up the most committed and most involved Jews or to reach out to less committed and less involved Jews uh, and, and bring them in and get them, engage them more. And here the example of intermarried couples, this is an example of Jews who may be more, who tend to be more on the margins of the Jewish community as opposed to in its heart. But the, what he's saying is Madoff's misuse of philanthropic organizations or stealing money, uh, uh, stealing all this money has pressurized the situation. You see, when there's plenty, and there's plenty of philanthropic support when Jewish, when Jewish organizations that rely on philanthropy and charity, when there's enough and they all can thrive together, you don't necessarily have to make the choice of where, how do we deploy resources? But when suddenly from the big pot of, uh, of Jewish philanthropy, there are billions of dollars missing because Madoff stole it all, suddenly the question takes on greater urgency. So what Tobin is saying is that Madoff, the Madoff scandal was not directly related to the continuity question and the continuity debate. It didn't, it didn't immediately, it didn't directly have to do with Jewish identity and survival, but indirectly in so far that the question of resources and philanthropy is always at the heart of the debate of how to, of how to strengthen and perpetuate Jewish identity and the Jewish community indirectly, Tobin points out correctly, I think, indirectly, the Madoff had everything to do with it. So this isn't only about a, an immoral act of corruption, it actually has a real impact. And here, this goes to the question of the fact that he stole money from other Jews and Jewish organizations, as opposed to, like, say, in the Panama scandal, from the population in general, 
what, what, what they, there's the element in the Madoff scandal that wasn't in the Panama scandal is how it directly impacted the, the financial situation of the Jewish community. So the Panama scandal, the Panama scandal, it uh, you know it uh, it undermined the image of French Jews or the image of Jews by fortifying the views of anti-Semites. And Madoff did may, may have done that in some sense, but Tobin says here the bigger problem is not the image problem. The, 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 the larger, more practical problem here is we now, the, the American Jewish community in the aftermath of Madoff has fewer resources to, 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 to disperse, to, to distribute. And we have to make some hard choices. And he wasn't just speaking in a vacuum, uh, Tobin. You know, you know, for example, young Judea camps who are supported largely by Hadassah, who lost a lot of money to Madoff, they, they almost didn't open up. They, they, they had to cut programs. They had to cut support. All sorts of Jewish organizations did it. There was a, there was a think tank at Berkeley in California which studies secular Jewish culture, the Posen Foundation. They almost had to shut down because they also relied, on, they, they, they were also investing with Madoff. So th that's, that's really what he's getting at here. So here he goes on to say, the pain caused by Bernie Madoff will be lasting and felt by a great many people. So he, here he's basically saying, the pain caused by Bernie Madoff is gonna to be twofold. Directly, it's those who actually lost, those who he, who he swindled, who trusted him and then he stole their money, but also it's gone indirectly in a, to a much broader group of American Jews whose ability to be Jewish, to participate, to run these organizations, just to provide support is going to be compromised because of Madoff. Okay. There can be little doubt that the method by which he used his Jewish identity to worm his way into the confidence of many Jewish investors and charities will be among the most memorable aspects of his villainy. And here is something novel. This is very different from the Panama crisis. In fact, the way that he, he, he targeted other Jews and he actually used his connections with the Jewish community to steal from other Jews. This is, a, this is something that's difficult to find precedent. You know, I was sort of looking through, I, you know, there, there, obviously there are instances when Jews steal from other Jews, but really nothing on, a, on, on this sort of scale. If there's something unprecedented about Madoff, it, it perhaps, it's, maybe, maybe it's this. But those concerned about the future of American Jewry have far more pressing worries than the money Madoff stole and lost or the ammunition he might have given to anti-Semites, okay? And here, he's responding directly to Bradley Burstyn. Is it real? Is the real issue anti-Semitism? The real question is whether at a time when resources are growing relatively scarce, and remember, he's writing this in February 2009 when the economy was bottoming out because of the recession. At a time when resources are growing relatively scarce, the American Jewish community will finally take the full measure of the threat to its long-term survival and husband its straightened resources to address that threat openly, honestly, and effectively. So here Tobin is saying that Madoff, what he did was terrible, but he also laid bare or laid bare a much broader problem uh, in, in for the American Jewish community, and that's the and and it, the question being: Are resources being distributed the most effectively and the most efficiently? Now, it, this is not a question: Are, are they being distributed the, the most fairly? That's subjective. The question is: it, Is it the most effective? Now, the Madoff scandal didn't invent this question. Let me give you an example of how that question of the effective distrib distribution of resources it has come up before. In fact, we, we had an example of in our own community. Now, let me preface it by saying that I, I, I'm not judging anybody here. I'm simply saying that this was a debate over the distribution of, of resources. When the Zeckelman family, I think it was, must be 20 or 30 years ago, when they gave that large endowment to, to have a new Holocaust Memorial Center, one of the best in the country, they gave $18 million. It was a remarkable thing. And let's face it, most of us thought this was just a wonderfully generous thing to do. But there was one criticism of that. Or, or I should say, one of the criticisms of that gift was in a community where, where you have to pay five figures to get a, a, a day school education, does it make sense to give $18 million 
to the Holocaust Center? Okay, now that's a difficult question, and it was a controversial criticism. But it's a but, uh, and that was before Madoff. But it, the question it's raising, the larger question is, is, is it the most in terms of Jewish survival, is the most effective place to put the resources in a day school to, to, to teach the next generation or to remember the past? Like I said, there is no way I'm passing judgment on that. Certainly not in this talk. I think I actually have in other talks. So you might have heard me do it, but I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it in this context. But, but, but here he's saying Madoff wasn't only about swindling. Madoff, Madoff his, his impact reverberated very broadly, but also Madoff forced the American Jewish community to ask a difficult question at a difficult time. See, these questions of resources and allocating resources, they become most pressing and most urgent when the resources get scarce, and this was 2009. So that's a more difficult question to answer in 2009 than it is to than it is to ask it, let's say, in 2021, when the economy is better and the economy is growing and there's and there's more. Okay, but here here's an example where, in the same way that with Panama, the the larger implications were seen largely in terms of anti-Semitism. Here, the larger implications are seen. While while there was a concern about anti-Semitism, the larger concern is more internally Jewish. Now, I don't want to say that anti-Semitism was not a criticism, but the, you know, the, the surge of anti-Semitism since the Madoff scandal has really, you know, I wouldn't say the Madoff scandal was one of its prime driving forces. The surge of anti-Semitism happened for other reasons. I don't, think, I, don't, I don't think you can look before and after Madoff and see a significant spike in anti-Semitism. There are other factors, but we have to, but that, that, that may be unexpected to us. And here, here I would make the following comparison because this tells us something important, not, not, simply, not specifically about Madoff or even American Jews, but about the, about the, the position and the, the, the standing of Jews in American society generally. And here I would make the following uh, uh, you know, fairly you know, odd comparison, okay? This, this might surprise you, but, 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 uh, but follow me here. You know, in the 1950s, at the height of the fear of communism, keeping in mind there is this recurring stereotype that all Jews are communists and all communists are Jews, there were two Jewish communists in the United States named Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, who were not only suspected, but convicted of selling secrets to United States' arch communist enemy, the Soviet Union. I'm not telling you anything I don't know, anything you don't know. Okay, but in the night, when, when that happened, at the height of McCarthyism, there, there was no massive spike in anti-Semitism. There, there was a spike in anti-communist agitation. But just imagine if that same thing had happened in the United States in the 1920s, you know, during the presidency of, let's say, Warren G. Harding, who was feeding anti-Semitism and all sorts of discrimination. The, the, the reaction, the anti-Semitic reaction would have been much, much more dire. Or if that happened any time in the last five years, there would have been a much more significant surge. The fact that even though Julius and Ethel Rosenberg ticked just about every, a, a whole range of anti-Semitic stereotypes about Jews, the standing of Jews, by, by the 1950s, Jews were mainstreamed into American society enough that Jewish, that, that the Rosenbergs were seen not not as Jews who were communists, but they were seen more as communists than as Jews. Now, it didn't mean it didn't mean that no one pointed to the fact that they're Jews, but th there were no riots, there were no pogroms, and something similar I think we have here with Madoff, because the Madoff scandal was a scandal, but it really was never never really became a Jewish scandal. There was no public referendum on. The, uh, uh, you know, on Jews as being dishonest. Other Jews weren't being, you know, persecuted because of what Madoff did. Now, this, does this diminish the severity of what he did? No. It, it, but, and what's more, it also underscores the fact how, in, how internal the Madoff scandal was. M most of those who were victimized were other Jews. And, and, and this is a crucial difference. But it, it but uh, it, it it, and further, it points to the fact that the, the impact of the Madoff scandal was more on the Jewish community than it was on 
on, the, on, on American society. There's no, no legislation really came out of that. Nothing really changed, you know, on, a, on an American scale. But in the internal Jewish community since Madoff, trust has been a big issue and the, the, the need to make sure that it doesn't happen again. All right. Now, let me, let me read one last thing written about Madoff. Uh, this is by, by, by David Hazoni in, uh, in commentary. This is in 2008. This is text number six. Let me share this here. Okay. And, that, and then, I can, then I can wrap it up. We can take some questions. Okay. This is called The Meaning of Madoff. Now, this is a writer who, you know, right after, he actually, you know, he, he was one of the first to really get a sense of what this is about. For America, we're talking about one of the biggest swindles in human history, and there need to be many many hard questions about oversight, reporting, regulation, and law enforcement. For Americans, that we know, that's basically the Panama scandal again. For American Jews, the question is different. Madoff and the money he managed were a central part of the Jewish financial ecosystem. Tragedy has struck in the form of countless charitable organizations suddenly left on a limb, whole foundations wiped out, and literally billions of dollars that will, that will not reach Jews in need. The hard questions have to do with how the disaster was allowed to happen, what could have prevented it, and how to cope with the devastation. And here's the point. The last question American Jews should be asking themselves right now is, what will the Goyim think? Now, this, I think, is really what the Madoff scandal is going to, is going to reflect about American Jews. And uh, uh, the, the fact that th there wasn't this panic over a surge of anti-Semitism in the aftermath of Madoff, it reflects a sense of Jewish confidence. No Jewish writer could have written that, that Jews do not need to worry about what, what non-Jews will think in the aftermath of Madoff. That could only be written by someone living in a community that, has, that is immensely confident, that, that, has, that has enough real power and influence and stability and a sense of security to be able not to worry about that. And that is a significant difference between the Madoff scandal and the Panama scandal, because the Panama scandal happened at a time when there was a surge of anti-Semitism and French Jews who were largely part of the French Republic were feel, feeling very insecure in 2008, American Jews really felt they were experiencing the highs and lows of America together with everyone else as Americans. Now, the question of course is 13 years later in 2021, would this writer make the same point? In 2021, in, in light of the surge of, of anti-Semites, of, of forms of anti-Semitism in the last five years, would we still be this unselfconscious about what Bernie Madoff did? Would, would we still be as willing to treat it as an internal affair and, and, and be less worried about how it impacts the broader image of Jews in America? My, my gut feeling is that with all that's happened, especially in the last five years, we probably would be more self-conscious about Madoff and the, and the image of Jews because it would feed into so much more anti-Semitic rhetoric, but it, it, it's hard to know. In any case, it's only 13 years or so since Madoff. As, time go, as times go by, we'll, we'll be able to have more and more of a perspective about Madoff. But what we do know now, well, first of all, is that there's, there's agreement that what he did was immoral, what he did was unacceptable, but, what, but also what he did, the, the, the challenge in responding to Madoff is not only an image problem, but as much, it's an internal Jewish resources problem. Now, the good news is, or the, the silver line to the story is, during the last five or 10 years, the organizations that lost money from Madoff, a lot of them have, re have recouped at least some of the money that they lost, either through gifts from other, uh, other philanthropists or through court settlements or whatever. Some of, some of those resources have been regained, but not all the way. In, in some ways, American Jewry in 2021 is still struggling to fully recover or to get back to where it was on the eve of the Madoff, uh, 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 of the Madoff scandal. This was an event that rippled through American Jews, American Jewry at the time, and continues to have an impact more than a decade later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, well, let's look at some questions. Uh, let's see. Okay. 
Has the Madoff, has the case of Madoff ever been finalized in the sense that his family and business having to pay back any of the money or was the money ever found in order, in order to pay back these organizations? Some of it was. You know, these things go on for a long time. So, uh, some of the money he stole was returned. A lot of it, a, a lot of it, um, you know, I, I think the, the estimate here, you know, as much as 80%, which is remarkable. Okay. All right. Uh, was Madoff swindling people right from the beginning of his career or did this all start later? That is a great question. Um, you know, and, and there are those, there's a debate about this. See, what we don't have yet is, is you know, the, those uh, Madoff's private correspondence, Madoff's secret memos. Eventually, uh, these documents, wherever they are, they're all going to be released. And some enterprising historian of, of late, uh, of early 21st century American Jewry is going to write a book, you know, the real story of Bernie Madoff, where these secrets will come out. Okay. Personally, my sense is that, you know, you don't just suddenly convert into a swindler, that he was doing this in some fashion or another, but he was, well, you know, he was smoothing it over th by, through, through his own uh, philanthropic endeavors and, and working with other with, with other organizations. Okay. Oh, the, a, a comment. The Rosenberg judge was Jewish and Ethel brothers, Ethel's brother, David Greenglass, was a key witness. Maybe these factors had the effect of inoculating the American Jewish community in this case. Maybe, maybe. I think the, I think the, the larger, uh, the remarkable thing about the Rosenberg case is that so, but by the 1950s, the, the, the problem over the threat of communism had been divorced, at least in part, from the threat of Jewish communism. In, in 1950s America, the stereotype, all Jews are communists and all communists are Jews, was still percolating around, but it wasn't as central and defining as it had been in the 1920s. You know, there were, by the 1950s, there were, there were uh, Americans, Jews and non-Jews, who were able to compartmentalize Jewish and communist. Partly this is because there were many, let's call them capitalist Americans who had suburban Jewish neighbors. They actually knew some Jews who were not communists. Okay. Uh, yes, Madoff's older son, it, it, tragically he committed suicide. Okay, here we go. Did the Madoff scandal break around the same time as the general financial crisis like Lehman Brothers? What did Madoff have to do with the effect of, of worsening what would already have been a major financial shock to the Jewish community? Yeah, yes, I mean, that's a great question. If Madoff had happened not at the same time where there was a collapse of the economy, the devastation of Madoff uh, wouldn't have been so epic. But the fact of the matter is Madoff absconded with all these, 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 these resources when resources abruptly became very scarce, okay? Who, when the movie out came out, who, who plays Madoff? Um, great question, but there already was a TV movie or miniseries, Madoff was played by Robert De Niro, though Michael Douglas would also be a great Madoff. I think Michael Douglas was too obvious because he's Gordon Gecko, you know, and it would, it would be hard to uh, us to see Michael Douglas uh, in that role, not as Gordon Gecko, because he, you know, he'll always be Gordon Gecko, and he was busy making movies, you know, making superhero movies with Mar with the Mar with the Marvel universe. Okay, yes, and, and Richard Drive, yeah, Richard Drive is yes. So there are going to be more movies about him. And like I said, one day more information will come out about Madoff. We know mo we know much of this story. We do not yet know the whole story, but we but we 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 know that it was a pretty lousy thing to do, to say the least. Okay. Um, those are the questions in the chat. I think on that note, I think this might be a good time to uh, to conclude. So thank you all for coming. Oh, oh this, I got one more. Let me see, you got one more here, let's see. Did the family change our last name? That's a great question. I know I would have, if my name was, even if I wasn't related, if I, if I was made off, I would definitely change it. Although mind you, there is a very good Jewish historian, political scientist named Raphael Madoff who writes about American Jews in World War II. He didn't change his name, I should say that. When I was making when when I was making this handout, I wrote Raphael Madoff by mistake at least three times. So, I, which would have been a terrible mistake. But no, as far as I know, they haven't changed their name. I don't. I don't. Uh, you know. You know. Maybe. I, I suppose that's a personal decision, or maybe they just want to get get, you know, get get some space from the event. Well, and in our last lecture, in our final lecture next week, we're going to turn to another contemporary event. We're going to look at the Abraham Accords and the and the recent debate around that. So if there are no other questions, thank you very much, and I will see you next week.